You guys look like... What do they look like, Jimmy? Dorks. <laughs> they look like a couple of dorks. Get those nerds! They're coming to get you, Barbara. What are you kidding? We got some family here. Can you dig it? Can you dig it? Can you dig it? You are listening to the In the Mouth of Dorkness podcast, the official podcast of the Alamo Draft House Winchester. Welcome to another edition of the It Modcast podcast. Joining us is Brian Young, the Turtle Dork. Better clinch up, Legolas. And also joining us is Lisa Gullickson, wife dork. Look at this. Ten years ago, nuclear was the preferred waste. You could dump it anywhere. Now everybody's a detective. And Brad Gullickson, mouth dork. Call me Mr. Lamb Fries. (laughs) And I'm your host, Derek Smith, the disco dork. A good fight should be like a small play but played seriously. A good martial artist does not become tense, but ready. Not thinking, yet not dreaming. Ready for whatever may come. When the opponent expands, I contract. When he contracts, I expand. And when there is an opportunity, I do not hit. It hits all by itself. And welcome to another edition of the It Podcast podcast. Yay! Yay. Happy birthday, Darren! Happy birthday birthday to you! You You gotta sing Brian's sing. Happy Happy birthday birthday to you! Happy birthday, dear Disco! Disco! Happy birthday to you! Be water, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> so How very old much. are you now? I'm not done singing. You're all oh, being okay. very rude. <laughs> no, I'm joking. I'm joking. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, I'm 44 years young. Nice. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm. I'm. Uh, I'm happy to be alive, and I'm happy to have such awesome and amazing friends. Uh, so mm. thank you for that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we love being was, your friend. How uh, was everyone's weekend, dork? It was fine. Yeah. <laughs> Just fine. One of them ones. Capital I gotcha. F. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> speaking of capital Fs, Brian, uh, fucker, uh, how was your weekend dork? Uh, okay. <laughs> like yeah, Brad, like Brad said, fine. It was just fine. Uh, just fine. Um, What'd you do? Uh, saw a couple, a couple of rewatches. Um, probably won't even really talk that long. I guess my weekend dork is really going to kind of focus on... <laughs> Uh, this documentary that I saw on HBO uh, called Stockton on My Mind, and this is about the uh, youngest mayor, um, and I don't know if it's the youngest mayor ever or the youngest mayor in Stockton, but I think when he got elected mayor, he was like 26 years old, and Stockton, California is right on the like outskirts of like San Francisco, Oakland and Northern California. And it's a really, it's, 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 it's a bad area. It's like, um, it's, it's a lot of poverty, a lot of crime. Um, there's a lot of, not a lot of, you know, money kind of being funneled into that city. Um, so him taking over as mayor and it really just kind of, you know, shows like his, not really like him going through, the the campaign process of how he became mayor but just him as the mayor and trying to clean up the city and trying to clean up uh, a lot of the crime and trying to start a lot of these different programs to help a lot of the youth and the homelessness um, in the community of Stockton and one thing that he tried to do in Stockton is that he wanted to start a program uh, where people could apply to receive um five hundred dollars a month like if you were uh, i think it was i think it's like if you were homeless or if you didn't have work or if you were like had like a criminal record or or something of that nature i can't remember exactly like you could apply um for uh these benefits where you could get five hundred dollars a month and there was a lot of pushback from the city of stockton because they felt like they were just kind of giving money away or they felt like they were giving quote unquote taxpayers money 
But as they were saying, like, this is not taxpayers' money. This was all privatized. This was money that was allotted for this particular program that really wasn't coming out of, like, the taxpayers' money. But, of course, you know, a lot of times a lot of people don't realize that, and that's kind of like the default thing that people like to just kind of yell and scream when they don't really know a lot of the facts. Not saying that in some cases that could be true where taxpayers' monies could be going to certain things that they don't see fit, but for this particular program, it didn't. that wasn't necessarily the case. But he was. this was kind of like an experiment that they were trying to try to stop people from... Uh, or try to lower some of the crime rate that was happening in Stockton by giving them some incentives, trying to incentivize a lot of the citizens of that area um, to maybe try to minimize some of the crime in Stockton. And um, I think uh, when you get towards the end of the documentary, it has some some excerpts and it gives some st- uh, some statistics on uh, whether that whether that system worked or not. But it was really, really interesting because then they kind of focus in on a lot of, of some of the other people in the community, like some of the kids in high school, and uh, it kind of tells a little bit of his backstory. It follows his wife a little bit, just to kind of give you an overall um, idea of who this man is and the community that he kind of supports and everything like that. So, I mean, it was it was an okay documentary. I I, I enjoyed seeing it from the aspect of a young man that's 26 years old that is really, you know, that that kind of became a mayor to really try to turn the city around. I thought that was really, really uh, intriguing and inspiring as well. Um, So, yeah, it's streaming on HBO right now. So I kind of came across that and definitely wanted to check that out. But, um, yeah. Uh, that I find that super intriguing, especially as we're having this movement, um, like to bring new blood into elections, not necessarily just new blood, because yeah. Donald Trump was some new blood and it was <laughs> terrible. It was yeah. the worst thing ever. We want no bad blood. No bad blood. <laughs> but like young, idealistic, passionate people with new ideas. Yes. Yes, absolutely. And to try new things. And even even, yeah. even if it's something that people may not be for, I mean, you have to experiment and try things, especially if you're doing it for the betterment of your community. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, it, it, especially if in, in, a, in a small town like that, that's the perfect way to like, okay, let's, let's put some of these programs in place to see if we can try to minimize some of the crime rate and get rid of some of the poverty and the homelessness that's happening. And I mean, to as as bad as it was in that city, to me, there, there there's only upside to that, you know. So mm-hmm. it's like, why not try it, you know? So I'm intrigued. Was there some kind of like reallocation of funds involved to get those five hundred dollars? Uh, I, I I'm not. I, it sure. sounds like I just. It sounds like I just have to watch the doc. Yeah, it's I, I'm not sure because there was there was something else that they were talking about as well when it came to because I think there were some other programs he was trying to implement as well, but I can't mm. I'm not sure exactly what the allocation of funds like how all of that stuff actually worked. But it was really intriguing okay. though. I found it okay. and and the the uh, the guy's name is Michael Tubbs, mm-hmm. and it was interesting too because looking at his backstory because he was trying to be kind of like a um, and uh, inspiration to a lot of the young kids because, you know, his 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 mother was a te- uh, was a teenage mother when he was uh, when she she had him, and his father was incarcerated and still is incarcerated, and um, I forget what it was for. I, it may have been like armed robbery or something like that, mm-hmm. and and they go into uh, the prison system to talk to his father. Um, so yeah, they, they, they go into all of that as far as like where he came from and him being able to kind of, you know, work his way out of that and become the mayor because he even says like, if you had asked me like, you know, 15 years ago, he was talking to these middle school kids and he said, yeah, I was, I was where I was, where you were sitting like 15 years ago. If you would have asked me that I would have been the mayor of Stockton, I'd have been like, you've been crazy. And you know, <laughs> this is where yeah. he, this is where he is now. So, uh yeah, yeah, it's a great, great, uh, great role model, definitely in the community. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. So that's stocked in on my mind on HBO. Uh, that's really all I got. I did some rewatches. Um, 
Uh, the rewatch roundup. Don't yeah. forget your branding, sir. Yeah, the that's re-watch. what we're tuning in for. <laughs> rewatch roundup. Uh, of course, Avengers. Our, our watch along that we do every Wednesday it was 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 awesome. Um, so fun. Yeah, yeah. So it was really great to kind of revisit uh, revisit the Avengers. Um, eight years was it? Eight years since that movie came out, and being so, crazy so far <laughs> removed from that first Avengers movies to, to movie to where we are now, but. Again, uh, we talked about it a little bit when we were watching it. Like, um, even though it's not like my favorite of the Avengers movies, it does have probably some of the 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 best moments um, from the whole MCU. Uh, they're just a lot of fun, especially when you think back to some of the like the first time. Uh, a lot of those moments, like when you experience that for the first time, just it just. It just really hits on all levels, so that was a lot of fun to watch. Um, the Saturday Night Movie on HBO was uh, Clint Eastwood's Richard Jewell. I talked a little bit about that last year mm-hmm. towards the end of the year. I really, I did, I liked that movie. Um, I don't want to say I liked it a lot, but I gave it three and a half stars when I orig- when I originally saw it, just because mm-hmm. I was compelled by the story of Richard Jewell, and I thought Paul Walter Hauser gave a tremendous performance as Richard Jewell. Um, I rewatched it again Saturday night, and I, I like it maybe a, a little bit less as far as just like the narrative flow of uh, the actual film, but still, I, I, it's just I, I just think it's just a great performance from Paul Walter Hauser, and it's just just really fucked up how they messed up this guy's life um, mm-hmm. with him actually saving yeah. lives. I mean, he should be heralded as a hero, and for him to be treated the way that he was, um, it's just. I mean, it, it just it just continues to kind of show you, um, I don't know, not just the corruption, but also just I don't know, just all the all everything that's wrong with a lot of these federal agencies that we have in this country, whether it's the CIA or in this particular case the FBI. Um, you know, I mean, corruption goes f- far up the ladder when it when it comes to stuff within the FBI. Um, which kind of kind of segues me into. I was talking to Darren a little bit about this. I just kind of want to mention this before I before I pass it on. Um, I haven't really been doing a lot of my trailer reactions, and going to put up a video on the channel in a little bit to kind of you know. Like, oh no! Don't tell him about our secret conversation. No, 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 no. Not <laughs> just, that. Kidding, just kidding. Just kidding. Just kidding. Just <laughs> kidding. No, but I just a little bit about as far as like what I'm planning to do uh, moving forward, as far as like with uh, the YouTube channel. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'll I'll be I'll be getting back into it. But I got some other ideas as far as what I want to do. But kind of speaking to FBI and Richard Jewell, um, there was a trailer that came out this week that rocked me. And I thought was probably the best trailer I've seen this year. And me and Darren talked a little bit about it. I just want to mention it here real quick. It's uh, Judas and the Black Messiah. This is a movie. Oh, uh, Oh, yeah. It's a movie uh, directed by Shaka King, produced by Ryan Coogler, starring... um, Daniel Kaluuya and Lakeith Stanfield, uh, the story of Fred Hampton. Now, I remember when they were casting this movie back when I was following movie news, uh, which is kind of like <laughs> something I'm not, not doing uh, too much nowadays for, for good reason. But, um, yeah, when I heard about this movie being made, because there wasn't, there wasn't really a title to this film, I just remember they said that, uh, Lakeith Stanfield and Daniel Kaluuya were going to be in a film uh, uh, telling the story of Fred Hampton. And, you know, a lot of people were thinking that Lakeith Stanfield was going to play Fred Hampton because it kind of resembles him slightly, a little bit more than Daniel Kaluuya. But uh, it came uh, it came to find out that he was going to be playing the informant. And so, but there was no title. And that was like the last that I heard of the film, uh, which was like months ago. And I didn't even know that they were filming the movie. And then all of a sudden, this trailer drops. And my God, <laughs> mm. this thing looks amazing. Absolutely amazing. And I think one thing, I mean, the trailer for me just gave me goosebumps. I think it's a riveting trailer with the music, um, with the editing of it, the way, you know, the, the way that the, mo- the, the the trailer just kind of compounds on itself and it really just kind of intensifies the more you, more you, you get towards the end of it. And then just seeing Daniel Kaluuya as Fred Hampton in his performance, um, just in those two minutes, um, it just, it's chilling. It gives you goosebumps. And I, it's, I don't know, man, it, it just, it hit me in the way that I was just, I was not expecting 
and I'm 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 kind of happy that his story is finally getting told because it feels like as far as like during like the civil rights movement in that era in the 60s um you know a lot of his story seems to kind of get lost in the shuffle of you know uh Malcolm X and uh and um um uh, Martin Luther King Jr and um Jesus Christ why am I why am I blanking on the president <laughs> <laughs> Kennedy, J- Kennedy, yeah. sorry, and uh, Mega Evers, um, yeah, the sixty, and and also what ended up happening uh, with the FBI and the informant, you know, as far as like you know the corruption in the FBI, as far as like them having that raid and and killing him, and I, I believe his wife was pregnant at the time when they did the raid, and you know, it's just just really really messed up but i'm excited to see this story being told and i can't hopefully we get to see it in the theater um i swear watching that trailer it made me miss going to the theater Mm -hmm. and seeing something like this and uh it just man yeah this this is high on my list whenever this comes out um i can't wait to see this movie so definitely check that out uh uh, judas and the black messiah awesome all right Uh, wife dork. Yes. My Week in Dork. Uh, yes. I'm ser- I'm serving up a smorgasbord today. I like um, that I- word. Oh, do you know what? It's Swedish. I just learned that today. Oh. That's a Swedish word. You're welcome. Uh, yeah, thank you. So, uh, the first thing uh, that kicked off My Week in Dork was the last episode of I'll Be Gone in the Dark. The documentary about Michelle McNamara and the Golden State Killer. And I was curious uh, how this would wrap up. How many episodes was it, sweetheart? Six. The six episodes. And they managed to, using um, Michelle McNamara's research and her ideas, managed to, and DNA evidence, managed to figure out who the Golden State Killer was. And uh, the last episode ended with the police arresting him. So I was interested to see how they wrapped uh, both Michelle's story up and then uh, the Golden State Killer's story up. And I think that they did it masterfully. I think uh, in terms of uh, true crime documentaries, I find this to be super... Uh, respectful and reverent of all of the effort that Michelle McNamara and passion she put into finding the Golden State Killer just as a lay person who had an interest a a dark interest uh, like she died in such a tragic way and I feel like uh, the access that her family gave to the documentarians uh, was huge. Like, uh, uh, Patton Oswalt, it, the famous comedian, is her widower, I would say. Um, and they allow access to texts between her and Patton that shed her death in a new light and I think not a flattering light in any of the parties involved. I don't want to like I don't want to give uh, give away that twist in the story. I also don't want to make it sound like anything too horrible. It's not like uh, any one party was super responsible for her. You can death. Wikipedia it. Yeah, you can Wikipedia it, but don't because um, all I knew going into this documentary was that her death was sudden. And shocking, and uh, perhaps related to an underlying heart condition, and um, there was much more to it than that. And I think that the fact that uh, Patton was willing to go in that direction with that part of his wife's story, I think, was pretty brave. And I think that the the there was nothing. Uh, I never felt like this was like a cash in. You know what I mean? On on a, you know, celebrity adjacent passing. Like it never yeah. none of it ever felt like exploitation to me. So I ha- if you guys haven't cracked into it on HBO, 
I think this is the perfect time to do it because watching it um, one episode at a time was absolute torture for me, just um, <laughs> considering uh, the darkness of the material. Uh, the Golden State Killer was a serial rapist and murderer and uh, this, the way he um, manipulated the victims and then uh, and his ability to uh, obs- obfuscate the police and not be discovered for decades and decades at a time it's all very scary it was it was all very scary and then you know of course it would drop at 10 o'clock on Sunday night and we would try to hold off to watching it on Monday but uh, we often didn't succeed so Sunday night just like good night and turn the lights off. And if I was a cartoon character, you would just see my glowing open eyes in the dark. <laughs> you know what I mean? But um, so, yeah. So if you, if you haven't cracked into it and you do have HBO, I recommend uh, this documentary series. It was really good. On the other side of the uh, true crime coin is a, there is a documentary called there's something wrong with I- aunt Diane. This one's a lot harder. (laughs) To me, I would say that this, when we're talking about exploitative true crime, I think this takes the cake. (laughs) I I felt very dirty after watching it. It uh, it was a car accident in which uh, six people were killed, including uh, two cars worth of people. I think it was more than that, actually. I think it's... Three. Oh, no. Yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah, I think it was right. two Six. people yeah. in one car. No, I think it's three and three. Three and, and three? And one child who's, who barely survived. The, the, uh, sorry, uh, when is this documentary? Is this a new one? or uh, It came one, out in... 2011. Few, 2011. Okay. Uh, okay. But it, it was just kind of bubbled up on our Hulu, I think? No, HBO. Yeah. Uh, this all running together. Yeah. It bubbled up on our HBO just because of, I guess, because we were watching I'll Be Gone in the Dark. It just, you know, algorithms. Algorithms. Oh! Um, <laughs> Jinx. Um, but it like uh, it was a car accident that was unexplainable, um, particularly by the husband of the woman who was the source of the accident. And he got some he was in complete disbelief of the uh, the toxicology reports of her of his husband of his wife's remains and uh and what i think makes this exploitative is that there i don't think i necessarily learned anything from this documentary there is no satisfying answers well, I, I mean would say. i disagree with the fact that i didn't learn anything i, mean, I think you... there's they they propose a mystery uh-huh but they're really isn't a mystery. Well, actually, there is a mystery, but there's no clear answer to that mystery. And so if you go into it wanting answers to what happened, you're not going to get it. I do agree that it's exploitative, well, especially what, what in the way by, that material is handled. Like, one of the things I enjoy about uh, uh, true crime documentaries is that sometimes I'll learn something about police work or I'll learn something about, uh, I don't know, forensic evidence or something about the judicial system where I go, okay, when there is a case like this case, like this is the way that it's handled. And I feel like I come away, like where I feel like in this, I learned the facts of the case, but I didn't necessarily, like, I don't know how to then apply what I learned to my perspective going forward. I don't think it's a forensic type of documentary. I think it is a... Human what, tragedy type of Yeah, story. it's a human tragedy, and it is how do we deal co- and compartmentalize tragedy and move forward. Mm. And so I do think you pull things about the human condition out of this. Okay. But all of those things are dark and sad and make you feel terrible. I think where the film becomes incredibly... Um, exploitative is what it does to the family that's involved and I think they show things that they sh- should not have showed I think that they do cross the line it's they do th- show remains they, yeah they show remains they show oh, crime shit. scene footage of bodies yeah. they're not body. they don't show the children's bodies uh, they do oh I close my they, eyes <laughs> but, but the, the, it's not as graphic as they do the main 
perpetrator and victim of this story. Um, but but it but not not only that, but also like the there are conversations that are obtained on camera that when dropped on TV in front of the eyes of the children as they grow up or the surviving child, I wonder, is it worth having this one moment so that that child's mind will be traumatized by this sentence that's spoken by one of his uh, parents or guardians? Yeah. Uh, I, like, to me, I just, like, my aunt, if I could answer that question, I would say no. Yeah, I agree. That's I why I feel like it's exploitative. I, yeah, I, I would say no. And, I, and I'm not, like, it was one of those where Brad was watching it alone, and he, then he started describing it to me, and then I was like, well, now I have to watch it. It's incredibly mm. compelling, but it is super sad, and yes, it does make you feel scuzzy. Yeah, so I, I wouldn't necessarily recommend, recommend yeah. this documentary in particular. Um, I, though I will recommend Karate Kid Part 3. Watch that ah, for the first yes. time. Um, I, I found myself profoundly moved uh, in the relationship between Mr. Miyagi and Daniel. Is Ralph this your Marchio. first time watching it? Yeah. Oh, and really? and oh, I had God. watched the first Karate Kid. And then I had kind of slept through the second Karate Kid. And for some <laughs> reason, none of them really penetrated like penetrated oh. my heart and um in karate kid part three they set up this metaphor of the bonsai tree mm. and there and how uh there was this one particular bonsai tree that was that uh mr miyagi had been cultivating uh and had allowed it to grow in the wild he 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 planted the tree in a natural place and allowed it to flourish on its own and create its own beauty. But then when Daniel gets in trouble with the Cobra Kai, because they have challenged him to um, defend his championship, and Mr. Miyagi was like, we don't need that. You know, it, like, uh, you know, the Cobra Kai, they fight dirty. It's not, it's not, um, it's, it's not a fight in good faith because you can really get injured. Um, so the Cobra Kai were threatening him and there was an incident where he had where he was trying to um, sell the tree to help Mr. Miyagi, but then the tree got damaged. What? And the way that that Bondry, uh, Mr. Miyagi, you know, Mr. Miyagi can turn everything into a lesson. And the way <laughs> yeah. that he was able to create this beautiful metaphor of the bonsai tree being able to heal from what had seemed like irreparable damage because of the strong root system just really moved me. Mm. And I loved like this portrayal of true friendship uh, between um, a mentor and a student. Hmm. That I you know sound what? particularly beautiful. Where, where, like, Mr. Miyagi, you know, being an immigrant, and, like, uh, it's it felt like at times he had a lot to learn from Daniel and a lot to learn from Daniel's family. But then, in turn, like, he's Im he is giving to his mentee this beautiful, not just karate lessons, but these life lessons. Yeah. It, that Daniel treats so revel reverentially. Um, I just, like, I, I loved seeing that portrayed on screen. And they also become mm. partners in the third film, opening up the bonsai shop. I, like, I just love the idea, especially coming off of sp speed cubers. We didn't think that I would relate those two nope. things. Um, <laughs> but the idea of, like, for anybody that you meet, there is a level on which you are peers. Mm. And you should, like, as a teacher, like, my my favorite type of teaching is not classroom teaching. Um, my favorite type of teaching has always been either one-on-one -on -one teaching or teaching towards a performance. Because I love the idea of being able to collaborate with my students and like the the way I try to connect to them is 
go like, we're making this beautiful thing together. You know, with my help, you are going to accomplish this thing. And I'm just as excited as you to see it happen. Um, and I think that like, um, that idea of everybody has something to teach each other. And all you have to do is keep your heart open and keep your eyes open and you can find what that thing is. And I think that we could all do a better, like do a better job of being peers with each other and finding areas where we can enhance each other's lives. And I think that that really got highlighted in Karate Kid 3 where more than the, the first two movies because of that sh now shared history of those other two films. I agree with that. I agree with that. I, it's not as good as the first film, but I, it was a lot of fun to watch it. I loved it. Karate Kid 3 I just realized I've never seen it. I've never seen it. So that song that I was singing, I just realized that that, that's two? from the second one. That's from part oh, okay. two. Yeah. That's why when you were describing the third one, I was like, that sounds like some shit you made up. I do not remember that. <laughs> it's great. As Lisa and was talking more about it, like I realized that – that one I refused to watch uh, back in the day. <laughs> Don't go back and watch it. And okay. Brian will appreciate this because he did bring up the point last week. Like, why does every female character need like a romantic, oh, yeah, 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 uh, yeah. a romantic storyline? Well, there is a female character in this movie where they have a strictly platonic relationship through the entire movie. There's like a yeah. little will they, won't they at the beginning of the movie, but then. Daniel gets shot down. She's like, sorry, I've got a boyfriend. And he's like, cool. And then they're just buds for the rest of the yes. movie. And then she moves. And uh, you expect mm. her to come back for that last fight and admit that she loves him. But, but she doesn't because guess what? The most important love in that film is the love between Daniel and Mr. Miyagi. Yes. Yeah. See, that, and that was me, by the way, Lisa. That was when we were talking about. I uh, am so sorry. Scarlett, Excuse uh, me. Scarlett Johansson. Oh uh, yeah, Black that Widow. is right. But uh, but yeah, uh, like the I, reason I I, uh, I remember that conversation is because I disagreed with you, and I love the yes. relationship between <laughs> Scarlett Johansson and the Hulk. So whatever. Um, yes. Yeah. So I recommend Darren in particular to watch Karate Kid okay. Three. It's great. I'm Here's the thing about Karate it. Kid Part Three, though. Oh, uh, don't shit on it. No, I'm not gonna take it. Uh. I'm not gonna take a huge dump on it. It's just that Daniel, you know, part of the storyline of all three Karate Kids is like at the middle point, Daniel has to have his ass handed to him, and and Mr. Miyagi has to save his bacon, right? Yeah. And like <laughs> Daniel doesn't learn how to defend himself until the climax of every film. In all three Karate Kids, right? Like you're like this kid's not going to be a good champion. Oh, he learned the crane kick. He wins, but you know, but by the skin of his teeth, he wins in part one. And then in part two, exact same thing happens. He still can't defend himself to the the bad guy in part two. But then at the end, he has the magic uh, uh, move that wins the day. And then in this one, he gets his ass handed to him like three or six times in the course excessive. of the middle. <laughs> and he is so brutalized in Karate Kid Part 3 that, like, I don't want him to win by the end because he's so bad at being the Karate Kid by here's, this point. <laughs> here's the difference, though, with Karate Kid 3. Like, by 3, he has really um, uh, absorbed Mr. Miyagi's message of nonviolence. Non yeah. mm. And... So, yeah, but he true. hasn't mastered nonviolence yet yeah, because Mr. True. Miyagi can um, be presented like like he can he can be nonviolence forward, but then still kick somebody's ass, yeah. which is hard to do. Right, right. So, yeah. like part and, two opens with Mr. Miyagi doing a total art with no fighting situation. It's, mm -hmm. He pulls a total Bruce Lee where. Martin Cove, uh, you know, the Cobra Kai guy, right. he comes in to, to, to fight Mr. Miyagi after the events of part one, and he Mr. Miyagi just positions himself in front of some car windows so that every time Martin Cove throws a punch, Mr. Miyagi moves real quick, and then Martin Cove's fist goes through the glass. And so Martin Cove is hurting himself, and Mr. Miyagi is really doing nothing other than moving. And my favorite part is when he gets Martin Cove into a headlock, and Martin Cove thinks that he's going to get his bacon handed to him. And then Mr. Miyagi honks his nose. Yeah, honk. It's so <laughs> oh, cute. Oh, yeah, I think I remember that. <laughs> yeah. That was part two, right? Yeah, that's part two. That's part two. Okay. But, okay. Which okay. they replay at the beginning of part three. But in really? part three, yeah. um, there is the villain character. What is his name? Which one? The, the evil? Terry? 
Is it Terry? No, uh -oh. the evil... Um, Instructor. The, yeah, the, what's his the, name? I can't... It's the guy from Vampires. It's the John Carpenter's Vampires main bad guy. Um, huh. But he... Uh, he tricks... Uh, he, and he's a former Cobra Kai who has now become this like huge CEO guy. I think he's living in the house from House on Haunted Hill. It does look familiar that house. Yeah. I think, but um, and he tricks uh, Daniel into taking karate lessons with him. Jerk. And he instills him with some of the Cobra Kai methods. And, no mercy! And then, when Daniel is put in a position of having to act out of defense of Jessica, he breaks someone's nose. So he what? is right. fully capable of defending himself, but then, after having that incident, he feels horrible, and he wants to find this guy to apologize. So, so like, it's not like in Karate Kid 3 he still can't do karate. It's in Karate Kid 3 that he really wants to follow Mr. Miyagi's most difficult lessons, the lessons yeah. of nonviolence, the lessons of being a good person. So that's, I, I, I really loved this movie. I think it makes me want to actually go back and watch Karate Kid 2 a little closer. And one, let's just go Yay. one and two again. One and two again, because Brad literally was paying attention to all three. That's right. I was the one who volunteered to just look at my phone. Well, I actually didn't rewatch one. I, oh, okay. I rewatched two and three. That was it. Okay. Mm. Well, it, yeah, we can rewatch one. I think I saw it in the theater one time. Yeah, yeah, we did at the Alamo, yeah. Yeah. Okay. The, um, I think, the Cobra oh, Kai, ahead. the Cobra Kai series. I know they're um, they just renewed that for season three, and they're moving that to Netflix from YouTube. Um, Ooh, have nice. you got have you have you watched any of that series when it was on YouTube or cause no? I'm not sure. Yeah, because I know it's coming. They they're going to put seasons one and two of Cobra Kai um, on Netflix um, leading up to season three. But I'm not sure when that's going to hit Netflix because that might be something. Because I know that's like a continuation. Of the uh, the Karate Kid saga, so to speak, but I've I don't heard. know if that. I, I mean, I, I will check it out if you say that it's good. But the Cobra Kai is definitely the least intriguing. Well, Dan, aspect Dan, of the Daniel Cobra. Russo is part of it too. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. That's why I ended up interviewing Ralph Macchio for oh, FSR. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, like I, I'm I'm cer certainly curious about Cobra Kai. I've watched a little bit of it because of that interview. But my thing about the show is it's missing the Mr. Miyagi character. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, which which is problematic in a lot of ways if you go back and watch all three of the films. There's some awkwardness there. But that tenderness that Lisa's speaking to uh, is the heart of Karate Kid, that friendship and partnership and how it evolves over those three films. That's, like, the, the main thing for me. Okay. And so to remove that element... Because Pat Morita is no longer with us, yeah. Um, it, that's that's a bummer. Yeah, and the spirituality mm. aspect I find really beautiful as well. Yeah, yeah. Yay! I guess that's the end of my weekend dork. I did watch all of the new season of Sugar Rush. They've made some changes to the show that uh, I good like. Or bad changes. At first, I didn't stand behind them, uh, but after watching the entire season. I don't I guess they don't mind. Came they, they made it for so the way that they've added to Sugar Rush is they made the I've complete I've already described Sugar Rush in detail in some former episode. So if you're like a diehard It Mod listener, you want to double Bless back. You. Well, then you've already heard this. But like Sugar Rush, so I'm not going to tell you what Sugar Rush is. <laughs> but I will tell you like they made one of the aspects of the show that when you've so there's three rounds when you've completed a round you have an option of either taking um, 1500 is it $1,500? Yeah. Either taking $1,500 or adding 10 more minutes to the cake round. And I was Ooh. like, well, that's ridiculous because no baker would ever take the money. They would always take more time. Because that, like, I'm thinking, like, Lisa, like, the most important thing is that you have a fucking gorgeous cake at the end. And a lot more <laughs> people take the money than I thought would. Yeah. And I think to their detriment. <laughs> Honestly, because if you're on a game show, if you're on a game show, you're mm -hmm. like the money that you win is going to be taxed out the ass and you still have to split it with your partner. 
Yeah, so $1,500 split two ways, then split another by the government. You're looking at 350 bucks. Like, so, like, I don't know. Like, I don't think that you get, get on, like, Sugar Rush to, like, make money. Well, there is the grand prize, mm -hmm. which is, what, like uh, $15,000? Yeah, so, like... Yeah. So that's something, like... You go for that. You don't go for the chump chain. I guess, well, because to me, I like the most important thing would obviously be the title because I have integrity. Uh, but I guess, mm. like, there is something <laughs> to winning the most amount of money that you can win on Sugar Rush. So I guess some people find that intriguing. I was shocked. Um, we did watch all of season one of Crazy Delicious. I'm for it. Mm -hmm. Carla Hall. DC native, well, she's not a DC native, but she did go to Howard University and she did go to her culinary school, was in Maryland. So I, I call her local. She, I think she was born in Tennessee. She's super rad. I love her, but I think this is, and she's, she's representing America on that panel um, of judges who are amazing. Um, the, uh, Heston and I can't remember. Nicholas. They, it's yeah, Nicholas Heston did. Blumenthal and Nicholas Exted. Um, I recognize Nicholas because he's a really super experimental Swedish chef who is... Jorge Bjorga, Jorge, Jorge. Uh, Swedish chef. <laughs> Not that Swedish chef. <laughs> but, uh, like, he's famous for um, taking, like, uh, natural and, and foraged ingredients and uh, really transforming them through experimental methods, which is super cool. I don't know that much about uh, Heston, like, from what they tell me on the show, he's, like, famous for, like, grilling meat. Smoking meat is his thing. I love the smoked meat. Um, <laughs> but I feel like Carla really rounds out that panel of judges. I think the only thing that I would want to change of Crazy Del Well, there are, there are a couple of things. Um, but, I, like, I miss having a show like Master Sh like Top Chef or Master Chef or Great British Bake Off where you get to see the same chefs every single week where like sugar rush and uh nailed it like they or uh even what's the one with the baskets i forget like where they have three like i like the idea of getting to watch an amateur chef gain skills through the course of the competition so i would prefer mm. crazy delicious to be that style of show where they start out with a dozen bakers and then they or chefs and they narrow it down by the end of the season because with Crazy Delicious they really um, emphasize experimentation and I think that um, I would love to watch the compounding of skills over the course of a series so that's it that's my weekend dork all right uh, Brad how was your weekend dork. Uh, it was fine. It was good. It was good. I, you know, while while we're recording, I'm getting word that there's been massive, massive layoffs at DC Comics, and there's been a massive oh, wow. restructuring at Warner Brothers. Jim Lee uh -oh. is no longer publisher oh, uh, wow. of DC. Wow. He's still with the company, but not the publisher anymore. Uh, wow. There's and they've 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 fired a ton of people. It looks like so. That's something that I'll hmm. be investigating when we get done recording this. We've gotten a lot right. of sad news now with uh, that. Uh, uh, now, movie studios are going to be able to own theaters now. Yeah, yeah. Another well, well piece that's of... yeah. There was some legislation that changed that will possibly allow studios to own their own movie theaters, which could be complicated. Yeah. And then cool. Disney has announced that they will not be going forward with physical media for older titles. Uh, they'll still release, you know, Marvel titles and Pixar oh, and new yeah. releases, but they will not be doing physical media of classic titles. Heartbreaking. So that's interesting. The times they are a change in. Yeah. Uh, some good movie news that happened this week or TV news that happened this week is it was announced that a, a one perfect shot television series is coming to HBO Max Produced yep. by Ava DuVernay and my boss Neil Mil Neil Miller. It, Neil, how Neil, cool, Neil Miller. How cool <laughs> is that? Uh, super cool, super cool. And like immediately after the announcement of that, uh, we gained thousands upon thousands of new followers on the One Perfect yes. Shot feed, which nice. is really great. And so uh, I'm taking a little bit of a step back from my writing to concentrate on the curation of One Perfect Shot. And uh, bringing out some 
big gun, uh, high definition gifts. So coming your yes. way. Didn't I tell you guys like as soon as Brad started would start making gifts, he would be unstoppable. Like literally, <laughs> it, this his future is it's uh, gifts. <laughs> is like rolling out before us, and it's being done in fifteen second bursts. <laughs> it's pretty great. It's, it's pretty his great. art. I mean, like the first, the, I just got done before we started recording. The first five new gifts that I did uh, for OPS was I did uh, uh, a shot from Insecure from uh, the, the last episode of the f last season of Insecure. Because uh, he just did, Brian, he just did a interview with the cinematographer of that episode. Don't, don't worry, I already texted Brian. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, Brian's yes. already jealous? Uh, oh, in fact, yes. I got a question from, De uh, from Brian to ask Ava, uh, yeah. so it was pretty cool. <laughs> but uh, I, the shot I picked from Insecure is after her and Lawrence break up after the Condola pregnancy oh, okay. uh, conversation, Issa goes out onto the patio uh, of her oh, apartment yeah. and she lights up that doobie. Yeah. And I don't think that's technically a doobie. A joint, whatever. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> I don't know, I didn't, I, I dropped doobie. all of my uh, marijuana flashcards. Okay. Uh, <laughs> she, she, she lights up that joint and there's the sunset behind uh, her and it's yeah. a really amazing shot. So I've I made a gif of that. Okay. I I made a gif of um, Spider Man into the Spider Verse, the What's Up Danger sequence, uh, yes. where after he's falling and then it has like those panels where you get like the anime panels mm -hmm. on top of the other panel, and, yes. which which is really rad. Did that shot? Uh, a shot from Star Trek the Motion Picture. The 1979 film where Kirk is doing the first pass on the Enterprise, which is an incredibly long shot and used to be too small or too long of a shot to comprise into a, a short gift for Buffer. So I now have a little more room so I can really grab big, long shots. And what was the other shot? I don't know, but I'm super excited about all of that. Um... What was the thing on top of that? I can't remember now. Uh, I guess I guess that I guess that's it for that. Uh, you know, going back to the Avengers conversation, uh, something that we were talking about while we were watching that movie was the order to properly watch it to enjoy the narrative as the primary function of the films and not the release date, right? So mm -hmm. Brian suggested that following avengers you shouldn't watch iron man 3 you should watch thor the dark world because that film picks up immediately after avengers with loki back in asgard in chains and i've never watched those two films back to back before okay and i gotta say watching it that way yes. really enjoyable oh yeah yes. okay. and, oh, yeah and, and, and <laughs> while like i I've never been a Thor the Dark World hater. I think it, it is unfairly maligned. Mm. Uh, it did rise up in my MCU ranking after watching yes. it this way. And yes. it's no longer at the bottom, which is where I had it. But again, I do like that movie. I'm, I'm not a hater. Uh, I've, I've moved The Incredible Hulk to the very bottom now. Okay. I've watched both of those uh, back to back. Uh, but like Thor the Dark World 1... I do think the chemistry between Natalie Portman and Chris Hemsworth is strong. Yes. I, I refuse to hear anything uh, contrary to that. Yes. Um, I also think that the humor between Darcy and her intern and, and their relationship is great. Selvig yes. is great. The, actually, all the human characters are really good together. The comedy is strong. Yes. All works for me. Um, I like really my only big complaints about Thor: The Dark World is that the Malekith stuff doesn't quite work for me. There's mm. things in it that I like, but I think that could have used a little more exploration. Yeah. And I think the cinematography, especially yeah. when dealing with the alien worlds, doesn't work at all. Yeah. I, I find it to be pretty muddy uh, and, and unattractive. Mm. Yeah, that was my biggest thing too. I think is mainly the cinematography. It just it just looks really drab, and it's just yeah. 
I like that's what that's so that's we that's one of my favorite things about the movie is the well, way that's, who looks. I mean, that just that, goes that's, to show that's that's you, that it's subjective, it's all good. Thor the Dark yeah. World, there's something for everybody, including yeah. if you really love a muddy alien planet. If you like a lot of dust, there's something in there <laughs> yeah. for you. And like the other visual thing that I feel like they dropped the ball on is in the at the end of the movie when mm. Mjolnir's going, flying all over the place as Thor's going between world and world and world. And so Mjolnir has to keep changing direction. Like, yeah. I love all of that. But when Mjolnir finally lands in Thor's hand, it's amidst that red swirl of ether stuff. Uh -huh. And Malekith is supposed to be like a frost giant size. And yeah. Thor is human size. And Mjolnir lands in Thor's hand and he uses that stake that Sel Sel Selvig has constructed, the teleportation stake, whatever the hell that is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he uses hammer and nail to penetrate Malekith, the frost giant, or the giant. I don't think they sell the size of Malekith. Right. No. It, like, I didn't realize that Malekith was a giant in that scene until, like, my fourth watch. Same. And Same. Also... They don't sell the hammer hitting the nail. Like, why don't they do that? Why isn't there a shot of Mjolnir hitting the head of the nail? It drives me crazy that there isn't <laughs> one there. And I drop a whole star for that missing shot. I yeah. Have to, I have to go back and watch that scene. That's a great right? point. Yeah. Uh, but all that being said, like a lot about that movie, the mind the gap sequence when Thor is taking the tube through London and that woman like quote unquote accidentally falls on him as the train gets going. So cute. It's oh, adorable. Yeah. <laughs> it's so adorable. So cute. And watching it and knowing that Natalie Portman is coming back in the Thor Love and Thunder, I'm really excited for that reunion. Yes. Mm -hmm. I've really felt Jane Foster's absence. Yeah. Yeah. Especially revisiting yeah. Thor one and Thor two uh, this past week. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I, I, I miss her a lot. Uh, and, and it is fun to watch Chris Hemsworth come into that character. Yeah. And while a lot of people think that it doesn't happen until Thor Ragnarok, where they truly embrace the um, more comedic elements of his performance, I think a lot of that is already there in the mm. dark world. Oh, absolutely. And, absolutely. and works well. Yeah. I feel like the birth of the Thor we have today happened in one instant in Avengers where um, like somebody they're talking about Loki and uh, he's like uh, that's my brother you're talking about and then people are like he's murdered millions and he goes adopted yeah. like it gets yeah. me every time yeah. and like for me, that is the instant where it's just like, okay, he, he is different from this point on. Yeah. What I yeah. also appreciate about Thor The Dark World is how it takes that, that, that element there that you're talking about, mm -hmm. Lisa. Th these are gods. These are beings that live for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. And they don't look at us as equals, right. right? And Thor's story, in many ways, is about learning to recognize all life on the same playing field. To His relationship with Jane Foster puts humans, puts Earth on a level playing field with Asgard, which is something he never would have considered before. And when Loki comes back and is in chains in front of Odin, and he's like, yeah, I wanted to rule them as a god. And yeah, I killed some people like you do, dad. <laughs> like, you've done that plenty of times in the past. You're a monster as well. I'm doing nothing you haven't done before. And that's 100% true. Right. And it's stuff that Thor has done before. And now that Thor looks at humanity not with his nose up, uh, but with his dick up. But with his dick up. There oh. you go, Lisa. Um, he's becoming a better <laughs> sentient being, you know. Uh, and, and and I love that aspect of the story. And also, uh, Rene Russo's uh, character, Freya, uh, um, the, the love that she has and the wisdom that she has and that she gives down to both Loki and Thor is powerful in this, especially within the context of Avengers Endgame. Yeah. 
yeah. uh, and her scene there. Mm -hmm. It makes you really cherish the little moments with Rene Russo. So, yeah, had a great time with uh, Thor The Dark World. The Karate Kid movies, watch those. Also yeah. watched the Chevy Chase film Funny Farm. Oh, yeah, we did. Funny and Farm. Holy I, crap. Uh, it was a random watch because it was on Prime. And <laughs> one of the things that Lisa and I do in the pandemic now is, like, rather than look at the movies that we have on our shelf, let's just randomly pick some weirdo movie off of Prime and watch it. And mm. that was Funny Farm this week. And uh, that's No pretty, regrets. That's a pretty good little film. Yeah, it's good. I like it. I'd never seen it before. I liked it okay. Yeah, it's good. It's fine. It's good. It's fine. It's good. It's, good. it's, good. it's three stars. <laughs> Jeffy Chase is a fine fellow. I mean, he's no, a, he's fun, he's he's a, a funny bastard. guy uh, in the 80s, but he's not a fine fellow. I wouldn't call him a fine fellow. <laughs> uh, yeah, and that's that's my weekend dork. Okay. Uh, my weekend dork. I didn't really watch too many new things. Uh the only thing new of note, I guess, I, uh, I'm going to talk about so we can hurry up and get to our review cast, uh, is I saw The Tax Collector. Oh, <laughs> yeah? Yeah. Uh, I, yeah, it, I, it wasn't good. You know, Shia LaBeouf's controversy aside, the, mo I mean, you know, the movie itself, it just, w it wasn't, it wasn't good, you know, um, the guy, the so it, it stars. Um, what is this guy's name? His last name is Soto. I, I, that was all, that's all I can remember now. I'm looking it up. But uh, this, the two main characters work for a drug kingpin named Wizard, uh, played by Jimmy Smits, and he's uh, he's in prison. But these these two guys, basically, what they do is just go around and they collect money from the different gangs and the different areas of uh south central los angeles bobby soto is the 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 lead character's name and he is the lead character not mm -hmm. shia labeouf yeah. it's not even a it's not even a um like a a co-starring role between the two shia labeouf is hardly in the film he's not in the movie a lot um as much as the as much as the trailers would have you think um Without getting into spoilers, though, I will say like, <laughs> I like I don't know like you know, seeing like Shia LaBeouf's performance in the film makes me wonder if there is a different and or longer cut of the film with more of him in it because he's barely in it and like mm -hmm. him getting his chest tattooed like in real life yeah no i'm thinking like dude you did that like for this <laughs> um and you don't and when you see it like it's not even like there's a scene in the film where he's just standing around shirtless or you see him getting dressed and you get to see the tattoo or he's laying in the bed with one of the many women he talks about um you don't even see it like until like this his last scene or, or whatever and so i was just curious as to like i wonder if there's something else like a you know with his character uh that they just cut out of the film because the movie is only an hour and 35 minutes but like there's a there's a lot going on so to speak but at the same time none of it really feels like it amounts to anything like it doesn't feel i don't know it I, 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 the, the editing of the film was poor. Like the writing of the film was poor. Um, the two leads, uh, Bobby Soto and, and of course Shire, are are good, but like the script is bad. Oh no! So you know, and, and me being you know a, a a huge fan of Shia LaBeouf, especially recently, and I've talked about you know my thoughts on his career, um, his you know as it later in his life. Um, so going into the film, like I was just, I was just looking f for his performance, looking to see his performance, and he does give a good performance. But I also can understand um, a lot of the complaints with his character. You know, the, the controversy of, uh, you know, uh, portraying a racial stereotype. You know, as someone uh, not a person of color, or, you know, portraying someone who's supposed to be a person of color. Like watching the film. He, that his character doesn't come across as that, but at the same, to me, it doesn't come across as that. It, it, it but I can see how it could to mm. to someone else. 
Um, he doesn't. He doesn't use a. Uh, he doesn't use like a like a cholo type of accent when he speaks, uh, for the most part. But like I don't know. Like there's two times in the film where he says something, and I and I was just the way he's saying it because he's he's speaking like with such intensity in these moments when he's you know shaking these people down you know uh, trying to intimidate them so like a lot of it is like this really intense like almost talking through your teeth so i can't tell if it i don't know it's questionable i'll just say that um so, so is this yeah. original i'm sorry i'm I, okay. I guess i don't know so is this originally based on uh something else a book or something not to my knowledge it's mm-hmm. just based on because david ayer uh, apparently grew up in you know los angeles in this area like and so i guess this story is just inspired by you know shit that he saw or you know just the people in the place that he grew up in and 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 also he says that that's what Shia LaBeouf's character is supposed to be this white uh, guy who grew up in this particular environment oh, yeah. influenced and shaped by that or whatever so, but, but but the stuff that happens in this movie, like that that wasn't his life. Like, it's not even yeah. It's it's a it's a it's a it's a, uh, a dramatic story. It's just make made up bullshit okay. or whatever. Uh, like all like David Ayer films, and yeah. that's my comment. <laughs> that's my yeah. So you know, I, I it's all it's. Thank you for, for taking rent. that that bullet for us, that Darren. Bullet. For the team, yes, uh, my pleasure. Not really. Um, it's available for rent uh, on uh, you know most platforms, but you can also buy it. Um, it's I was confused because I thought that it was going to be released like some of these newer, um, newer films where they charge you like nineteen bucks to rent it. You know, yeah. uh, and then later on, like a few weeks later, they they make it available for like you know regular rent prices or, or purchase prices but it debuted in that way like you could pay fourteen ninety nine and buy it or you could pay i think like six dollars to rent it um so if that's your bag definitely you know check it out it's available if it's not your bag if you don't like david if you don't like david air as a director you're not gonna <laughs> like this film i do want to say if i was doing a good the bad the ugly i'm gonna spoil this part uh because i really don't care um but the ugly would be so this is <laughs> there's this scene in the third act the third act gets fucking nuts and i don't mean that like in a good way um but like the pinnacle of how nuts it gets i think comes in this moment where like so bobby soto's character um david is they the he's trying to go get his kids like his kids have been he- taken for ransom they're being used and held for ransom right and so he's he has to find out like where they're being kept um so he goes he declares all out war and he's going around like he's just fucking people up and he's so he he he's run he runs down this one gang and he they he's in a van full of people that are helping him out and they take the dude in the van and they're driving and they're, and he's like you know he's got him on the floor <laughs> yeah. he has the side door open and he's like tell me where my freaking kid i'm paraphrasing i just because all i remember <laughs> is what happens next tell me where my fucking kids are and the guy he's not spilling the beans so they hold this motherfucker's head out the window i mean out the door of the side of the van and down onto the ground like while he's driving and i'm thinking like all right well like when he when they pull him up, he's just going to have, like, some road rash. This motherfucker looked like Two-Face in the Dark Knight. Like, <laughs> it's a really gnarly, like, really gnarly uh, practical effect on his face. Like, he looks like the dude. He looks like what's his face from Overlord. Remember uh, when they were up in the attic when, like, shit uh, got crazy and, like, half of that dude's face was gone? Like, it, that shit was like that. But it wasn't, like, a CGI uh, effect. Like, that shit was practical. So, kudos uh, to David Ayer for that, because there's several uh, like the shootout scene that's in the trailer. That shit was done uh, with practical squibs, and uh, in in the in that shot, whether it be on the person or in the in the room that was getting shot up, that shit looked dope. But I'll, and I appreciated that, and I just appreciate and it. It doesn't it doesn't fit in the movie. This effect, the dude's face. Um, I don't like that it's in the movie, but I just do appreciate the fact that like he just went that hard with like the practical effects. So there's some. Some old school practical effect guy that got his rocks off, and it's on the it's on the on the screen, and uh, I kind of dig it. 
Uh, but other than that, like, yeah, you can save your money and rent something else, maybe. Uh, that's going to do it for My Week in Dork. Darren, uh, can, can I uh, say one more thing about My Week in Dork? I remembered what I wanted yes. to mention. <laughs> do uh, it. One of the things that I was doing last week was watching all of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle franchises because I've been uh, curating shots for Saturday morning cartoons as part of One Perfect Shot. Mm. And for a long time, I was avoiding several iterations. There was like the 87 classic that I loved, and that's pretty much it. I never really bothered with any of the other cartoons. I have to shout out the 2012 Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, the CGI, uh, like... 3D rendered ones. Yeah. Loved that series. Really enjoyed revisiting it. There's a three part Usagi Yojimbo storyline that is top notch, that that adapts um, the, uh, well, it adapts a section of the Jai storyline from Stan Sakai's comics. And the way that they, they animate this story is periodically it will like cut to Stan Sakai illustrations. So oh there'll, there'll be like a, a Usagi Ojimbo cl- extreme close up on his eyes. And there'll be, it'll be like a sword slash into the a black frame. His eyes will now be within that black frame. And then his eyes will transform into Stan Sakai's illustration of Usagi's eyes. Really, really powerful. That's crazy. Animation. Highly recommend it. And I would also say that the new Ninja Turtles, Rise of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, while the comedy doesn't always work for me, it's very much in that Cartoon Network or Rick and Morty kind of vibe. There is some animation in it that is like... It's it's amazing. It's Yeah, it's amazing. It's wild. It's it's Highly anime-influenced. Yes. um, (laughs) Totally bonkers and has to be seen to be believed. What is this? Rise of the Teenage Rise yeah. of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. That's the oh, newest okay. one. I think they just ended that series. They had the series finale recently. You didn't like that one, right? B? Nah, it was too. It it's really is for kids. It, it's 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 very kind of kitty, but yeah, the animation. You're, you're right, Brad. Like some of the action sequences, it's very anime exp- in, uh, inspired, and um, I, sometimes I'm in awe and just the way they animate a lot of that stuff is fucking crazy. There is a shot of Raphael when he is, he, Leo falls off a building and Raph jumps over the side to get him. And, and so at the top of the the shot starts with Raph all the way at the top. And then he's flying toward camera and his eyes go all the way up to camera and tears start to like stream out of his eyes and then he grits his teeth. He the face pulls out of camera. Uh, he does a kung fu move in the air. His body elongates, uh, leg first like a crazy uh, ninja kick, and then uh, this red mystical energy explodes around him, and he flies back into camera. And it's all one shot, and it's nuts. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Yeah, it's it's crazy. They they have a clip right now on on Twitter from the series yeah. finale. I don't know if that's the one you were talking about. No, that's no, they, no, that's, 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 that's something one. different. Where they're fighting Shredder, and they they do some crazy stuff. Like the animation is all over the place. But there's a part where Leo is running, and like he throws one of his swords, and then he calls out for Raph, and then and like. So and then Raph like is running behind him, and as he like drops his sword, Raph Raph picks up his sword, and then like attacks Shredder with it. It's it's fucking crazy. Like it's wild. But I would say that with Rise of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, yes, the humor falls flat a lot, yeah. and you will roll your eyes at some of the jokes. But I'd say just just like keep watching <laughs> yeah. because the, sh- the episodes are fairly short. The they're like 22 minutes and they're usually like broken in half anyway. Yeah. So they're, they're, they're like bite sized episodes. You can consume a lot pretty quickly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, real quick. Uh, shout out to wife dork. Uh, I saw two comedy specials Ew. as well. Uh, Sam J in three in the morning on Netflix. Mm-hmm. Highly recommend her. She's funny. And I also watched uh, Hannibal Buress's, um Miami Nights, which is available on YouTube as well. I like that one 
um, in that format and how he did that with the screen and everything in the background. Yeah. Uh, I recommend those too. Uh, that one too. Uh, so yeah, that was my weekend dork. When we come back from the break, uh, as per my birthday request, our review ca- uh, our review cast re- is going to be for uh, the box set, uh, the Criterion box set, Bruce Lee, His Greatest Hits. Um, yeah, if you haven't seen any of these movies, uh, get this box set. It was available. I caught it on a, uh, a sale for like 62 bucks or something like that. Um, but at normal price, I think it's like uh, one ten or something. But it's on worth the, it. I'm on the Criterion site right now, and mm-hmm. it's currently on back order. Oh, okay. Um, so pre-order it or put your order in, or can you reserve it? You can't. Yes, you can. You can. Right? You can okay. purchase it on back order on the Criterion.com. It's ninety nine ninety six. Okay, so that's cheap as I've seen it since it was on the special that I got it for. Uh, so definitely check it out and buy it and then come back and listen to our review cast. Uh, stay tuned. We'll be back after the break. Hey, this is Liz from People I Think Are Cool, a bi-weekly podcast where I interview my favorite creatives from across the globe. If you're looking for a dose of creative inspiration, then go to peopleithinkarecool.com or subscribe to People I Think Are Cool on iTunes and Stitcher. You like film, from cult to classic, from blockbuster to B-movies. And there just isn't that one place with all the fan fervor and passion that's covering the kind of mad, diverse brilliance that you love. Well, that's where you're wrong. AfterMovieDiner.com is that fan-built movie nirvana just for you, featuring the sweet, sweet writings of the wife dork herself. AfterMovieDiner.com. Go there. Be the best you can be. And we are back, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, this week review cast is for the Criterion edition of the Bruce Lee collection, His Greatest Hits. Um, I already own a a collection on Blu-ray of Bruce Lee's, um, films, but this set here, when it was announced, well, I automatically knew it was something I was going to, uh, have to purchase, um, and it's Bruce Lee. Like I, I, I would double dip on Bruce Lee uh, memorabilia, movie stuff. It doesn't matter. I, I would double dip if I had to. Um, it, but in this case, this set is way better. Firstly, uh, the remastering of the, the image quality. Uh, well, I, you know what? We're gonna do our good, the bad, the ugly for. That's it. right. So I will say that for that. Um, Brian, we'll start with you uh, with the good. Oh, <laughs> did you get this? You you know what? No. You mother. No. So we will direct all of our comments to Brian because Brian needs yeah. to put his copy on back order yeah. on Criterion.com. <laughs> yeah. I, I watched um, one of the movies. I thought that's what we were going to do. But, I mean, I watched, what do I watch? Fist of Fury. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, if I, you're going to watch I, one. Yeah, I watched because that's on Amazon right now. So I was able to kind of watch that uh, prior to. But, no, I don't have the box set. <laughs> you should uh, listen to your, the rest of your fellow dorks as we extol all the, the fine virtues of this uh, box set. But Brian can still do like a good, the bad, the ugly of the things that he watched. Fist like, of Fury. He's seen Fist of Fury. He's seen Enter the Dragon. Yeah. Yeah, I've seen that. Um, I'll try. I'll try to recall some of it. But I did have some. Qu- I'll let you guys go. But I did have some questions about Criterion overall. But um, but yeah, no, yeah, I'll, I'll definitely have some input. Oh, okay. I like questions. <laughs> All right, uh, wife dork. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Um, I for my good, I like um the idea of because Bruce Lee had such a uh, dazzling yet compact career. Mm-hmm. I like having all of his. St- starring films in one place yeah. alongside all of the uh, interviews and the biographical information I like having like I like having his film and kind of cultural con- context all in one package yeah I yeah. Um, I, th- I found like being one of the it mod dorks and being married to Brad Gullickson, I've seen a lot of Bruce Lee documentaries and 
it, and uh, it's hard to find new, 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 new information about yes. Bruce Lee, but I do really appreciate like having it like like being able to watch the additional content alongside the works. So yeah. I I like that a lot. Um, my the most goodest of all of the films is of course Enter the Dragon. Yeah. Is my favorite. Um, yeah. I, I but I do like seeing the arc of him finding himself. Mm. Like the mm. where he like he was always like f- from the bonus material. Uh, he was always an artist with a particular uh, vision of what he knew he could offer that was entirely unique. And he was willing to fight for that on literally every level. Yeah. And um, and to, to watch his uh, visualization be realized over the course of the, you know, uh, three years between the big boss and um, Enter the Dragon is just so exciting. Yeah. And then to put into context, like, what the game of death was supposed to be um, oh. is, is, like, is an entire narrative in itself. Like, you watch each movie for what each movie has to offer as a story, as the choreographed fights, as, like, I love this era of film, yeah. And the idea of getting to see this era of film in China is so exciting and so yeah. interesting to me. Um, but then watching it as watching the performance and watching the performer really, um, he always had his voice, but really mm-hmm. grow in his voice and grow in his power and grow in his style. It's yeah. like, it's exhilarating. It's super exhilarating to watch. So that was my good. Bruce Lee, he's good. Uh, yes. <laughs> I think you're onto something with this Bruce Lee guy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, B, how about you? Good. Uh, yeah, I mean, good uh, to have Bruce Lee under the Criterion banner is mm. such a thrill, right? Yes. Um, and, and and to have them bring their supplement game to the material that Bruce Lee provides is exhilarating. And so like the first thing I did was watch all the supplements before I revisited the movies. Uh, And they do do a a pretty darn good job of giving you the context to each film. And I think it is something that absolutely enhances your enjoyment as a viewer when watching the big boss, because like the big boss is not a great movie, um, but in the world of Bruce Lee, it's an incredibly crucial movie, mm-hmm. uh, and in some ways, maybe the most important movie as his first film with Golden Harvest. Uh, because you got to remember, and we talked about this in our It Mod Spotlight, but Bruce Lee was rejected from Hollywood. Hollywood did not want Bruce Lee, they gave him a shot, but not really, you know, like every time uh, there was an opportunity to put him as a lead, uh, they gave it to David Carradine. They gave it to David Carradine. Yeah. Uh, On two occasions, which of course I knew about Kung Fu, right? But I didn't know about the silent flute and how that was also an American production that never got off the ground with Bruce Lee as a lead. But after Lee died, uh, David Carradine went into that role uh, and they got that movie made because of the celebrity that came out of Enter the Dragon. So mm-hmm. very, very, like, there's so much frustrating and um, awful history behind the Bruce Lee um, rise, uh, which only <clears throat> makes his rise all the more powerful and inspiring. And so, you know, when he gets to the big boss, and you're watching the big boss, like, the first time you watch that without any context, you're like, when is Bruce Lee going to do something? Yeah. You know, yeah. like he's he's the star of this movie. But no, he was not the star of that movie. You know, o- originally he comes to Hong Kong because he was going to go get his mom and bring her back to the States. But when he landed in Hong Kong, 
uh, he was swarmed by uh, photographers and paparazzi. And he's like, well, why, why are all these people uh, uh, interested in me? I'm just the guy from Green Hornet. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm nobody in America. But because he was Cato from Green Hornet, he was seen as the Hong Kong kid who made good and was a major celebrity. And on that visit, he started doing like late night talk show uh, interviews uh, in Hong Kong. And he saw that there was an opportunity here that wasn't there in, a, in Hollywood. And he actually went to the Shaw brothers and was like, hey, let's make some movies together. But the offer they gave him was nothing um, uh, particularly uh, financially interesting. Yeah. And Raymond Chow of Golden Harvest heard about the Shaw brothers offer and then went gunning for Bruce Lee. But even then, he brings Bruce Lee onto the big boss. And what the deal was, it's so ridiculous. But, you know, he he, he was the supporting player to um, what's the other actor's name? I'm blanking on it. Uh, oh, gosh. Uh, I'm not going to pronounce it properly. But uh, he was, uh, uh, well, the character is Hu Su Chi. Mm -hmm. And oh, it's uh, oh, James good. Tien, right? Yes. Yeah, James Tien. So James Tien was supposed to be the star of The Big Boss. But because Raymond Chow and Lo Wei saw the charisma of Bruce Lee, they're like, actually, let's make him the lead and kill off James Tien. And so, like, after 30 minutes of The Big Boss, finally James Tien is killed and Bruce Lee is able to become the star that he was destined to be. And that moment in the film and the way they work that into the narrative of, you know, he's made a promise to his mother. He's not going to fall into violent ways. And when he finally gets pushed by the uh, the Thai um, uh, worker, not the worker, but the foreman, when the Thai foreman falls into Bruce Lee and yep. he, he, he his uh, medallion is broken and he gets this wave of anger in him and then he unleashes himself like, it is such a glorious moment, especially given the context of Bruce Lee's history. Yeah. And he takes over the big boss. The movie becomes immediately uh, far more engaging. And then that takes him into Fist of Fury, which maybe not my favorite Bruce Lee film, but it's my second favorite Bruce Lee movie. Fist of Fury yeah. is astonishing. Yep. Uh, and, and so, yeah, I, I loved all the, the, the context that Criterion brings to it. Like Lisa said, there's not like a ton of new information there if you're not already a Bruce Lee maniac. And the same could be said for the Be Water documentary that's on ESPN's 30 for 30 right now. But the mm -hmm. thing with the 30 for 30 is you get that personal touch. We, yeah, you get a little bit more of a personal touch because of all the uh, lives that he encountered and it's yeah. all told through their narration um but what what's important about the way criterion sets it up is that they give you the tools to make you appreciate these films even more mm. and that's yeah. what criterion should do uh and yeah. you know uh, matthew polly uh bruce lee's biographer that they've given like 15 minutes to on every film he does a damn good job of letting the audience know the significance of every movie because there is no film in Bruce Lee's short career that doesn't have significance. And whether you like the movie or not, there is an element in that film that is amazing. You just need to be yep. aware of it. Yep. Uh, and, and one last thing, way of the dragon is my least favorite Bruce Lee film, but because mm. of the context of that they, that they blanket the way of the dragon in. And I was able to appreciate Bruce Lee's direction. And I, I think I knew this beforehand, but I, I, I didn't latch onto it, but I was unaware of how much of a fan Bruce Lee was of Jerry Lewis. Mm -hmm. And knowing that and watching both Fist of Fury and way of the dragon, you understand the comedy that happens in both of those yep. films. Oh, I mean, no. he's practically playing Jerry Lewis in yep. one scene in Fist of Fury that yeah. feels so odd. Yeah, but yeah. that's I why I loved. I always, I've always loved that scene because to see this guy who is Superman like go Clark Kent, 
like hard. It was always so funny to me. I love that movie. That was the one thing that stood out when I watched Fist of Fury. I was just like, wow. I was like, this feels so different from everything that I know <laughs> about. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I, I, I liked it. It was kind of refreshing to see that. I didn't, because I so didn't know he would do, st- he did stuff like that. I was like, oh. That's how great he was. So, uh, Brian, when you <laughs> watch Way of the Dragon, the first like 15 minutes, of where the dragon is Bruce Lee need, needing to have to take a piss. Like, no, because this he's is had part of so my much ugly. soup. <laughs> we'll get to your ugly. We'll get to your ugly. Uh, but like, that's like, it, it, where the dragon is way goofier. It takes all that like goofy element from Fist of Fury and extends it over the course of the whole film with yeah. periodic beats where he goes into kick ass mode. Okay. Yeah. Um, all right. Yeah. I echo everything that you all have said um i would add to it <clears throat> and you know this is par for the course when you talk about criterion but just the just the, the the design of the like the packaging and the you know the imagery the you have the iconic uh yellow and black um and, and like lisa was saying like having all his filmography together with the supplements and you know as someone who I've, you know, I've lived Bruce Lee for you know, my entire life, like, you know, studied him, like, you've seen every documentary, read all the books. It, it is really hard if you are a, a, a huge fan of him. And it is hard to get new material. Um, but for me, it's not the, it's not so much uh, having new material on him or or not this this set not really having anything on it that I wasn't really aware of but I just appreciate for the people who don't know about Bruce Lee or just think he is just a a, a movie star a martial artist this uh, criterion has created the the perfect all-encompassing encompassing package that for the uninitiated and believe it or not as as world-renowned as Bruce Lee is there are some people who just know of him or of his face or know his um his weight in the zeitgeist right but they don't know because i was explaining to jennifer you know who bruce lee was and but talking about the 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 philosophies all the books his writings his art you know his drawings um his dance you know the, the the person not the actor not the characters that he played but the person like there's so many people who don't know the person they just know of the guy on the poster or the guy on the screen and i feel like like everyone has said here you know having having the context uh is so close you have it be married so closely with the material like on your on your shelf where you don't have to go searching for it or wait until you stumble upon it like you have it and if you do like uh like brad do, did and and watch the supplements before you watch the film uh, or rewatch the film, it does uh, give an added context to ev- everything that you see, and it can and will inform and maybe give you a new perspective and a new appreciation uh, for it. Like case in point, perfect example was the the humor in the in the film and the fact that it stems from Bruce Lee's uh, admiration of uh, Jerry Lewis and his style of comedy. Um, it's a it's almost like a duh like a eureka but like it totally makes sense like it, you and so you and 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 it, because you love bruce lee you know even if that brand of comedy isn't your thing or it feels too broad for you or whatever you still go all right well okay i see what he was doing and you still find something like it's like brad said no matter which film you, you're talking about there is always something amazing in in every single one of them so if that comedy is not your bag like don't worry you know he's not being funny when he's whooping everybody's ass like that's in there like that scene you know getting to the end of that movie is worth sitting through the the rest of that movie The, the the coliseum scene fight scene in way of the dragon is my favorite uh is my favorite film documentation of Bruce Lee's uh, fight choreography. It's my favorite fight of his. And he's had more quick fights. He's had more brutal fights. But knowing who Bruce Lee was uh, philosophically and, and what he thought of uh, 
martial arts and its language and how to to use it as a form of expression it's and and and, all, and that fight encapsulates everything he he was and what would be the foundation of Jeet Kune Do and that he's pulling from he's pulling he's taking the fat off of all these other things that he sees in the martial arts world and he's pulling the best most essential elements and he's crafting them together and making them fit and function in a way that is efficient like no other or, 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 or any other martial art and you can see like his influence of boxing you know he's a huge fan of Joe Lewis and Muhammad Ali and you would see that and he he spoke philosophically about that. He wrote about it. He taught that. Uh, it would later be, be uh, uh, the foundation of movement in Jeet Kune Do. But you see it put into practice. You see um, his philo- his philosophy cinematically in that in that fight in a way that isn't represented in a bunch of his other fights. Yeah. And so I feel that's it's just my favorite. It's just my favorite uh, uh, you know moment on film. And and it, and it doesn't hurt that. It, that it's Chuck Norris that he's fighting, you know, yeah. the, the, the the internet meme legend, you know, uh, and Bruce Lee, he's going up against the, the, the a true legend, and and you know, in the martial arts world, in the true martial arts world, Chuck Norris is is a legend in his own right, like he's he has so many uh, accomplishments, um, but just a, as far as just a just a, a a figure outside of film, like he just it's impossible for him to measure up. To Bruce Lee, but then you know the fact that I love the fact that Bruce Lee was never above another martial artist or art, and in in the sense that well, I'm a practitioner of Chinese kung fu, and karate is a Japanese martial art. It is not as efficient as uh, kung fu or Shaolin boxing or whatever. He was never of that mind. He he saw benefits in it as well, and him choosing to have Chuck Norris in the film I spoke volumes about how much he respected not only Chuck Norris, but just karate as a martial art um, because it, uh, Bruce Lee wasn't totally dominant that entire fight. Uh, Chuck Norris being the practitioner of karate that he is at, at such that level was able to force Bruce Lee to have to be adaptive and change up his style. So it, it forced him to change and grow out of his shell. So Bruce Lee, you know, Unless you know to look for or understand that him having Chuck Norris there and 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 using that style, just was spoke volumes about his respect for it. And so I don't know. He's just a, he's just a great individual. So that's my good as well. well that, that's Lee. the beauty of Bruce Lee, right? Where it's not just about adapting uh, the fighting styles. It's it, it, he takes from everything to create something new. He's new, not yeah. resistant against any one thing uh right you know and, and so he is adapting boxing he is adapting karate you know uh all, all that stuff he's uh adopting um jerry lewis and you know that battle cry that he does oh, is God. like an extension of his passion for yep. japanese samurai films and why he doesn't perform like other actors uh, in Hong Kong at that time is because he is bringing uh, a level of theatricality from his Indian obsession bread. of Japanese cinema to his performance. And I think that is something that doesn't get highlighted enough when talking about Bruce Lee is he wasn't looking for realism. He yeah. was looking for drama. He was looking for the very heights of the art forms and whatever art form that was. And yeah. uh, I watched um, I watched Fist of Fury and Way of the Dragon right next to Stanley Kubrick's The Shining. Mm. And because mm. I was taking in this idea of samurai performance, Chambara performance, Toshiro Mifune, and applying it to Bruce Lee, I then yeah. started to apply it to Jack Nicholson in The Shining. And that is a performance that I've always sort of dismissed. I'm like, ah, it's so over the top. But that's the point of The Shining, you know, when, yeah. when he's fully possessed and taken over by the Overlook, he's no longer operating on a human level, nope. you know? And, and, and so, like, that made watching the Bruce Lee movies made me appreciate another movie, which was also kind of cool. I just yeah. I have a question for Darren. 
Yes. Um, because I you are also our our tech geek TV dork. Like, yes. is the restoration going to be part oh of my. your good? Oh my gosh. Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, the rest the restoration is immaculate. Like I said, I have I have another I have another set. Um on blu-ray and it's one of those ones that comes in like the regular blue blu-ray case that's just kind of thick and it has the flap in the middle yeah. that you mm-hmm. can double side disc or whatever it's, it's one of those um and the the restoration on that one is better obviously than uh you know a dvd or what you would find like on on uh tv or cable or whatever um but the just the coloring and the correction and uh, the, the the cleaning of the image is much more uh, pronounced to me uh, compared to like other versions. And it, always in my head though, but it, because as a as a kid, like I've watched his movies at nauseum. I mean that and just kung fu theater. Like always in my head, I always picture these movies and like uh, a TV quality, like yeah, four eighty p. And to me that has never been a problem like even when like uh when i would watch them on vhs like kung fu movies on vhs or when dvds kind of came out like still watching them on vhs because i preferred that the the ugly the muddy quality because it just reminded me of like you know watching kung fu theater on or Saturdays. asgard right <laughs> <laughs> <Call back. laughs> uh but and so it, I was I never really sought out or cared to find like the best image quality or print of you know kung fu movies, but like this set and the one before, but this set more importantly, it's almost like it's almost almost if I hadn't watched these movies so many times, it almost feels it'd be like watching a you know it for the first time or a new movie. Like mm. it's really good. It's really good. Yeah. Um, the image quality, sound wise too. Um. And just the supplements, uh, I just, I just want to say because there's so many. Uh, but one that I appreciated on here is um, is a little is a little uh, piece about the Bruce exploitation that came about after his passing, and uh, it's that is gloss that that's briefly hinted at in some of his other documentaries too. But I appreciate uh, its presentation here and also. Um, they have uh, some supplements featuring like the the English dubbing performers. Yeah, um, I always wonder and thought about like why there isn't a documentary about the people who used to dub like kung fu movies because yeah. they have a they have a very specific sound like all like all no matter which kung fu movie it is if it has an English dub they almost always and I don't want to say sound the same but there's a very distinct sound to the voice acting in those films and I find it so fascinating and I found it even more fascinating that there's not been a look into that. Um, I found a- like the, the like English dubbed voices like those performances to be so soporific <laughs> like yeah. they are so flat <laughs> like yeah. and uh, I don't know I kind of I think they have their own charm to them. Lisa uh, w- this go around we watch them with the English dubs because they include uh, the original English dubs yes. yeah which yeah, are not the yeah. ones on the previous blu-ray set right and um, I, I don't know I think there's a charm to them Lisa couldn't stand them. I couldn't stand them. I, I can I can I can understand that I can understand that but as also like Brad said like there's just you know, because when they would show them on TV, it would be dubbed. It won't. It wouldn't be until I could get into like uh, home video that I could get subtitled versions. You know, in the native language. Um, so for me, like I always, I'm always used to kung fu movies like with the English dub. You know, that doesn't match the lips. Like that was, that was something that I was used to. So, um, but I. I do like going back and watching. You know, when I got the other, the previous box set, I think that was like the one of the first times I had watched a lot of these films, in uh, in that it, with that particular uh, uh, vocal track, and so I appreciated that. And so, um, yeah. But this this set also, speaking of the uh, the uh, supplements, has a, a bunch of different uh, audio options as, as well that I appreciate, That's and, fun. They're, and they're they're mastered well too. Yeah, and the guy uh, who does um, the Bruce Bloitation uh, uh, doc, Grady, Grady Hendrix, 
is on uh, In the Mouth of Darkness. We've had him on the podcast. So <laughs> yeah. go back and listen to those It Mod Chatcast episodes. He's the author of Paperbacks from Hell, uh, which is what we talked to him about. Yes. All right, uh, Brian the Bad. The fact that you don't have this box set, Lisa, <laughs> yes. the bad. Um, just I'll say one more thing about the English dub. You're not going to let yes. Brian even yes. do a bad on his movie that he watched? <laughs> oh, yeah. Go <laughs> ahead, Brian. And I'm sorry, wife, Dork. Is oh, it? your go has to be postponed, too, so we can accommodate the guy who doesn't own the box set. No, go. no. I mean, well, I, again, like I said, I'm pretty much kind of just listening. Not really a bad, but I did kind of want to mention something as far as like what you guys were talking about. Bruce Lee as a as a performer because it's interesting like for me watching him or knowing who he is I never really looked at him as an actor because every time I think of Bruce Lee I always think of him as more of like a teacher an educator um, a philosopher um, and he's kind of like a, a person that would kind of use movies and his stardom as a vehicle to just kind of like push more of his philosophy and things like that and i don't know is this interesting watching like uh what's the one fist of fury um you know seeing him as a performer like doing some of the comedic bits and seeing him uh have more dramatic moments and just seeing him as an actor um because it's it's like like his persona seems like it's much bigger than just being an actor. So to actually see him, especially the fact that he had such a short career before his untimely death, it's almost like that. That idea is the idea of Bruce Lee is so much bigger than just him as an actor. But then when you actually see him as a performer, it's really interesting to see you know how how good he was and how serious you know he kind of took in a lot of influences that he had from other actors and performers and how he brought that into his work as well. So I just found that to be intriguing because you know it kind of kind of humbled my own expectations of who he was, you know, not saying that he wasn't those things, but, you know, he also was an actor, you know, yeah. and, and it's also interesting to see, like, you know, if, if he was still alive, like, what his career would have looked like, um, you know, because we talk a lot, like, sometimes, like, I talk to my friends about people, I, I think about, like, Tupac. And in hip hop, a lot of people say, "Oh man, you know he died at 25." But you know, if he if he was still alive, like he wouldn't be rapping. You know, he he his mind was so much more. Like you know, he would have been an activist. He would have been this. He would have been that. Like he was so much bigger than just hip hop. You know, like would he still be d doing music if he was still alive? And sometimes I think to myself, like that's how I I kind of see. Bruce Lee, like, yeah. if he was still alive, would would he really be, you know, still doing movies, or would he be like trying to like do something bigger and greater? And that that because that's just what he seemed like he was. So I just found that to be interesting watching uh, the film that I watched. So it's that's, also that's... such a bummer that you know, on Fist of Fury, and actually all the films before Enter the Dragon, you don't get to hear his voice. Yeah. Because yeah, even on yeah. the Chinese uh, cuts, those are dubs, and right. it's not Bruce Lee. Yeah. And and that's such an unfortunate um, yes. yeah. aspect. Yeah. 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 Uh, that's the, that's the, the one, of, one of the greatest things about Bruce Lee and what I love the most is that like it's 2020 and Brian's just having this revelation about him, right? Mm -hmm. So like people will say, man, why are you putting on another box set or whatever? Like it's unnecessary. No, it's not because some, there's somebody out there who, who doesn't know yet and who's going to discover and have that revelation about him and, and, and be able to, you know, then give him that respect that he deserves yeah. because he is more than what you, what you think. And that was, that was what he was, you know, and not it's not what you're it's not the same way, but that was what he dealt with like his whole life, uh, you know, be becoming something outside of people's expectations of him or what they thought of him or what he should or shouldn't do, like you know, running into that that, that issue of dealing with the Chinese community and not wanting him to teach Chinese kung fu to Westerners, um, or the the Westerners seeing him not as someone who was a bankable star, but as just some Asian person, right? And him growing beyond all of that shit. Um, 
Yeah. Yeah. I love, though, like, um, Brian started what he said by saying that he thinks of Bruce Lee as a teacher and a mentor first. Yeah. yeah. And I yeah. think that that is, like, the definition of an icon, where mm. you look at Bruce Lee and you see Bruce Lee. You don't see actor. You don't see clinician. You see, mm. like, you like he... Bruce Lee defies categorization. Mm -hmm. And I think yeah. that yeah. having, like, the narrative of his life and to go, like, what are the components that create an icon? Like, it mm. is reverence for the material, be it film, be it martial arts. It's also yeah. a growth mindset. He was always looking to make himself a better person. He was always yeah. looking to... Um, make this world a better world. Like, yeah. I, I just, I just find that I, I just find what Brian said really interesting, and the context yeah. that what you gave, uh, what Brian said, very interesting. Yeah. yeah. So here's my bad. Uh oh, <laughs> let's hear it. So, like, my issue with the English dubs, like, is <laughs> that what? Well, well, one, like, uh, they're very flat. The performances mm. are very flat. And to me, I wish they would just give up with trying to match it to the lips. Mm -hmm. Like, just yeah. why not you just give me what they're saying in Chinese, in English, and I'll just yeah. accept that it doesn't match the lips. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So, that, yeah, that that's why I don't like the English dubs. Um, yes. My initial bad when I was creating this good, the bad, and the ugly is the uh -huh. amount of flatulence humor in Way of the Dragon <laughs> is insufferable. <laughs> like I, I love that Bruce Lee thinks farts are funny. I, uh, like, I, I guess, I mean, that makes him more of a man to me and less of an icon. But, like, I just, like, like, I've... Like I don't get tee hee hees at bubble guts. I just don't. Like I'm a I'm a lady, and I don't I don't want it. And then um, my last bad is me being a little bit picky because yeah. Matthew Polly, as an autobiographer, he's as an autobiographer as a biographer. He's clearly. I was gonna put this in my ugly. Oh really? Um, his level of upspeak when he's giving mm. information, grates on my very nerves. <laughs> he's like, uh. um, when Bruce Lee moved to the United <laughs> States from China, oh, like, I'm just man. like, ah. <laughs> That is and so funny that you mentioned Upspeak, because I just watched a podcast when they were talking about Upspeak and how people hate that. I cannot stand it. And, it, and probably it was because I had like, one teacher at Fox mm. Mill Fox Mill Elementary School yeah. that would berate and humiliate children who used upspeak. Well, um, you know, like because because uh, at it, the end of a sentence your voice should go down. You know? Yeah, and I yeah. think that upspeak is is a def defensive way of speaking to prevent interruption. So like if you're a person who um, has grown up being interrupted a lot and um, and feels like they have a lot to offer narratively, they do fall back into this defensive pattern of going, well, my sentence isn't finished, so please do not start talking. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, yeah. like, so as a person who is super sensitive to that, like, like just my heart goes out to him because he is clearly very knowledgeable. Um, but, and not, and just because you're this amazing biographer doesn't mean, like, you're an orator or a performer. And he's put it in this, like, performance venue um yeah. but oh, dude it drove me crazy it didn't bother me at all until lisa kept pointing it out and then i would have to watch the supplements on my own and she had complained about it so much that it started to irritate me thanks yeah. lisa. i it, am a monster it, it, is, it, it can be irritating man i've heard that people do that as like a coded way of talking like they say that it's, it's really prevalent in like the tech world like in like Silicon mm -hmm. Valley, like a lot of people do that up speak and they do it to kind of like let you know it's almost like a status thing and it's almost like a coded language to to a degree. I, oh, I don't that's know. Interesting. I, it's it is what annoying. The fuck? <laughs> like to, like if it was a coded language, then uh, children wouldn't be doing it in elementary school. Oh, that's right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, they're doing it as kids. That's. Ugh. I I think it's a it's 
a, a sentence structure issue. I think that it is a, uh, yeah, I, and I do think that it should be, pe people should be encouraged not to do it because yeah. mm. it does make you sound a little bit unpolished. Mm. But I sympathize, and you know what? He never, he never, he didn't sign up to be this, like, you know, amazing interview giver. Like, that is a, that is a particular skill. Um, and I feel like a, monster criticizing it um but you gotta find something to complain about i gotta find something to complain set. about and yeah. so i'm gonna shit on this poor guy who's amazing <laughs> all right <laughs> all right now wipe your butt bread the bad uh the bad will always be game of death yes uh, of course yeah game of death will always be the bad it will always be the ugly um, yep. It is such a tragedy what happened with that film after the death of Bruce Lee. For those that don't know, it was actually filmed or parts of it were, were filmed. Uh, about 35 minutes were filmed before Warner Brothers came in uh, and uh, made the deal to make Enter the Dragon with Bruce Lee. And so Bruce Lee abandoned Game of Death to go make Enter the Dragon, but then he died actually before Enter the Dragon ever came out, so Game of Death could not be uh, completed. Except, because of the celebrity of Bruce Lee and the success of Enter the Dragon, they had to complete Game of Death for more money, and they found really offensive and horrible ways to complete that, including hiring doubles uh, and putting bizarre masks on other actors to make it look like that's Bruce, Bruce Lee. And when I say bizarre masks, I mean... 2D cutouts of Bruce Lee's face on top of a, an actor's head. Uh, it That's is crazy. astonishingly so I found, bad. So I found out that, that 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 2D cutout was was put on the mirror. Oh yeah. And then they had the guy just like positioned behind it. It's <laughs> so crazy so bad. Weird. It's yeah. crazy bad. It looks yeah. so uncomfortable. Uh, and then, you know, it infuriates me, like literally mm -hmm. it makes me it upsets me. The game of time. death sequences that Bruce Lee did com complete are amazing. Uh, mm -hmm. But when they are edited into the final product, they're cut up with a double uh, to push the narrative along. And so there's never a moment while watching Game of Death that you can appreciate even the elements that Bruce Lee did contribute. Ah, yeah. but here's the great thing about this Criterion box set. They provide you with Game of Death Redo, or Redux, however you want to pronounce that. And it is literally only the elements that Bruce Lee shot in Game of Death presented to you. And that, that means that they're actually not even cut the same way that they are presented in Game of Death. So it, it feels like nope. an entirely new experience. Here's my other bad. I wish they had restored this because yeah, it looks like yeah. butt uh, as a supplement. Yeah. And it is so yeah. frustrating that it looks like butt because here's your opportunity to present this material for the first time ever as a new thing. It's got a copyright of 2020. This is a 2020 film, Game of Death Redux. Why is it not restored? Why, like, it, yeah. it, it's infuriating. But it's also great that it's here. But that's, yeah, that's all my bad. Uh, my bad is, uh, yeah, I, I don't really have a bad. Yeah, um, nice. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't have a bad. And yeah, I'm, 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 you can say I'm partial, I'm biased. Uh, but the, but the truth is like supplement wise, again, not just for myself, but this is a box set that, and this is what I do with this stuff anyway, is for someone who doesn't know him. I'm going to give them this box set here. You can borrow this and everything that they need, everything that I would want them to know about him is in this box set. And so because of that, like I, there's nothing bad. That I don't, I don't think that there's anything bad uh, with this box set uh, in my opinion. Um, Brian, the ugly. Uh, no ugly for, for me. Um, I guess I'll use this time to just kind of, well, you guys really kind of answered it for me just uh, throughout this conversation because I've always wondered, like, what was the big thing about Criterion as far as, like, it, to me it feels like it's something probably more so for cinephiles um, because I, I didn't know if there was anything special outside of, like, 
whether it's like the box art or just the restoration of the footage or if it's like you know the special features or the supplemental uh um uh, things that are on the disc but it's all of that yeah and a lot of times i just because I, I i didn't know like what makes it different from like any other like box set you know that somebody would get like if you had like you know restored like 4k version or anything like that because you know when people mention criterion like people lose their mind like is it kind of like mondo like yes yeah. it's, it's well i don't i don't know that there is a restoration to a film that criterion has done that has not been better than every other format of that film okay, mm. okay. like when they like when they restore a film i mean they i don't know specifically what their process is or who their team is but i mean that that's that's the specificity of this company is to to make the best restoration of the film possible and to provide the best supplements and present them in the in the in the the best way and with the highest of highest quality okay and so they every 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 film every supplement uh you know every part of this package feels like it it comes from a place of respect for the cinema for the art form okay i love the fact that this their that their title is criterion because criterion as a word means like this is the standard like this is yeah. this is by which all other box sets shall be measured, and yep. so I and that's why like um, it's such a status symbol to have a film be in the Criterion Collection because that means it's worthy of this exhaustive amount of restoration and research yeah. and supplementary material. Yeah. The yeah, dream, think- like as a film writer, is to get your get an essay in a Criterion film. Like that yeah. would be fucking amazing. Yeah, and I think over the years I've kind of, you know, had a little bit more respect for that. But because I just, I just, I know so many people who are just not like casual movie fans, and a lot of people just don't care about a lot of that extra stuff. That I don't know. Like part of me was just thinking to myself, okay, like what is setting itself apart? That you know, could you get a casual fan to? you know, speak of Criterion in such a high regard as cinephiles do, but it seems like it's something that's, I don't know, geared more towards, like, a specific type of, you know, um, a demographic that kind of respects that material. Yeah, but I do think that, let's say um, you're a new film uh, viewer, you're a younger kid or, or or what have you a noob a, a, yeah i don't i hate the term noob but like <laughs> what? It, I think it's it's a, because noob sounds like you're like you're it's feels like, like a boob no it feels like, like a derogatory term it feels oh, like you're talking really down so. to somebody you okay. don't think calling somebody a noob is talking no, down to them? i think like like anybody can be a beginner all at right, something. all right but what i'm saying is if you're new to learning about film yeah and somebody puts a criterion in your hand like let's say it's you you love silence of the lambs oh there's a a special edition of silence of the lambs let me take a look at silence of the lambs and then you look at the exhaustive supplemental material that's provided in the criterion silence of the lambs and suddenly you go like wow look at all this awesome stuff that they've given to one of my favorite movies what other things do they do Hmm. and like i i feel like and they were for me like criterion was a gateway drug uh, physical media like the the original Criterion DVDs uh, you know of course they had Akira Kurosawa I was familiar with Kura Kurosawa and then that led me to go oh well, well who's this Ozu guy and suddenly you're watching Ozu films and okay. you're like oh I don't really understand this Ozu film I don't get it this isn't for me but what's all this special features stuff on here and then the special features tell you why some people really appreciate and adore ozu movies and suddenly you go like huh interesting i need to know more and uh, like it then you become addicted to discovery Mm. and i think that's what criterion really does well i i appreciate criterion even more now as the idea of the supplementary material is kind of a dying art. Because yeah. I remember yeah. when we first started transitioning from VHS to DVD, and you would put that in, and you would see the menu with the special features, and you'd be yeah. like, what is this? Yeah. And, yeah. like, you would love, like, you would watch the, like, they would have, I remember, uh, uh, like, they would have, like, 
all of these like director commentaries and interviews and and um, bloopers. I still love bloopers. Bloopers are always my favorite. I would love yeah. to see a Criterion bloopers. No, I don't know. But like, I just love that as an like the idea of especially of like TV shows I watched. I, I love to go and see the supplementary materials. But now as they're trying to make physical media cheaper and cheaper, like. I, uh, Fewer and fewer. Yeah, and fewer and fewer. Like, now the supplementary material is falling away. So, like, um, the fact that Criterion is so revered and it's keeping the idea of supplementary material alive is, like, so exciting. Well, I think, like, the only physical media that will survive will be loaded with supplemental material because they'll need to sell that stuff for a ton of money yeah. to yeah. the well, addicts. <laughs> like, when you, when you buy a movie on iTunes... Um, you get, I mean, they have like all the, yeah, you have the menus but like and stuff. The, 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 the supplemental material you get now on like a Marvel movie when you get all that, the supplemental material on iTunes is garbage. Yeah. Like for the most <laughs> part, it's straight trash. Russo <laughs> Brothers put a pretty good commentary track together, but that's it. Yeah. But like even if you track yeah. the Marvel movies and you look at the early supplemental materials and the featurettes that they would make, they were way better in phase one than they were in yeah. phase two and where and in yeah. phase three. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, Lisa? Well, we're on my ugly. Um, yes. My ugly, you've already mentioned it, is uh, yeah. the Bruce exploitation following yeah. his death. Like yeah. I knew like I knew that it was a thing that happened. Um, but I did really mm -hmm. appreciate Grady Hendrix's little uh, documentary of right. this aspect of, like, uh, the aftermath of an icon kind of thing. Like, and the fact that it didn't result in, like, hey, look, uh, a person of color can be this mega film hit. They're like, we no need more exactly Bruce Lee's. But this was in China. But you know what I mean. Like, yeah. um, how his icon status didn't make more stars. It just yeah. became, like, this weird snake eating, I mean, trying to eat its own I mean, some people, child. like, rode the wave of Bruce Lee, but it didn't become, you know, like, mainstream uh, because of racism. Yeah. Uh, but, but, like, you know, yeah. Jackie Chan <laughs> rides the wave of Bruce Lee. Yeah. Donnie Yen rides the wave of Bruce Lee. Sammo Hung r r rides the wave Jet of... Jet Li. Yeah, Jet Li. I mean, there's definitely stars that come uh, out because of Bruce Lee, but for the most part, yeah. I mean, it. Um, I'm talking like in the '70s, or yeah, well, you're talking, and you're well, you're you're talking about Hollywood acceptance, right? Yeah. Like you weren't suddenly getting a bunch of Chinese-led films in America and Hollywood. Mm -hmm. No. They learned nothing from <laughs> the, their colossal failure w with Bruce Lee in, in America. Yeah. So yeah, that's my ugly. Uh, B. Uh, I mean, I think I've covered my ugly mostly with all the game of death talk, uh, yeah. the upspeak talk. Um, uh, you know, I do love this box art. I do think the box itself is a little disappointing. Um, I, you know, I, I compare this to the Godzilla set and I compare oh. this to <clears throat> the Lone Wolf and Cub set. And I think yeah. that the quality of the box material, and I'm talking the paper itself and the way it's constructed, is not as good as the Lone Wolf and Cub one. And I kind of wish, even though there aren't nearly as many films as there are in the Godzilla set, but you get this crazy oversized uh, album situation with Godzilla. Yeah. I feel like these five films are worthy of that massive album that they did for the Godzilla set. It, that would be great. But uh, what are you going to do? The art itself is gorgeous. Yeah. Uh, all right. Uh, my ugly is, you know, will we, it's the the Bruce Bloitation thing. You know, I I remember as a kid that angering me. Mm. Like when uh, when I was young, you know, when I was a kid and uh, Chinese Connection, um, I'm sorry, Game of Death comes out and – I was my, I don't know if it was my dad who told me, but like I was aware, I was made aware back then that that was like real footage from his funeral. And then like I would go to the Blockbuster and go to the Arrows and like it'd be all these movies, uh, Bruce, Bruce Lai, Bruce Lay, uh, you know, uh, The Dragon's Return, Rise of the Dragon. And like, and I would, 
I would be like, but that's not Bruce Lee. Like, that's not Bruce Lee. And it would make me mad mm. because I would, I, would, I would think, and it's so weird. I'm thinking about this. this is the first time I've ever recollected this. But uh, I would think back then, like, what if someone sees this and think this is Bruce Lee? They don't know the real Bruce. And, like, that made me so angry. The thought of that happening, like, like pissed me off, like, in, in such a really profound and weird way when it came to him. Like, I don't know. Like, it's funny. I just, I never really thought back on that. But I used to really, it would really bother me that those movies existed because of my fear was someone was going to see them first and think that this is Bruce Lee and not know that he, that's, you know, he's a, a, a great person. He's this real huge, you know, you know, icon. And so, yeah, that's, yeah, so that that bot. So yeah, every time I don't I don't even watch Game of uh, Death anymore. I didn't I didn't watch it on this um, uh, in the set, but I did watch the the Redux and um, which I've seen I've seen that footage before. But um, but I do so. I, but I appreciate that being on here. So because it just gives you a, it just gives you a, a better idea of where Bruce Lee's uh, what his headspace was and. That's the thing about Bruce Lee that I love. Um, I know I'm gonna say another good. I'm sorry, real quick. Mm-hmm. Is that he was always he was always trying to leave something for others, you know, whether it be this martial art that he was creating to teach other people to teach other people and, and accept it, be accepted by all and, and accepting all. Like he was always he was always trying to leave something. It wasn't just just trying to do a movie to get a check and so I could have a star in the Hollywood Walk of Fame. Like he was trying to leave something that would be what it is today that would be far, more far reaching than his filmography it would be his teachings it would be you know his philosophies it would be his inspiration um and so i don't know like that's just such a profound thing to me anyway um that's it that's for our, that's it for our good the bad the ugly uh thumbs up thumbs up thumbs up from the it my crew a highly recommended box set uh, whether you know who Bruce Lee is or you do not, uh, if you know someone who doesn't know who he is, uh, this is worth the purchase, uh, no matter what price point you get it at. Unless it's like some really, 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 really crazy, ridiculous price point, then just wait until it's back in stock at Barnes and Noble. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, and or I'm sorry at Criterion. Uh, <laughs> so yes, uh, Brian, what are you looking forward to this week? Um, I guess our review cast for next week. I don't know if we talked about this, but. Uh, uh, Project Power uh, drops on Netflix. Oh shit! Yeah, this Friday. Yes. So I guess we'll. Uh, I guess I guess that'll be our review cast. But I'm I'm excited to check that movie out since the oh, trailer since the trailer dropped uh, for that. And um, bu- 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 what else is coming out this week? I don't know. Maybe that's it. Some some other rewatches, some new discoveries, whatever, whatever crosses my screen as I'm channel surfing. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, you can follow that guy at th- the Turtle Dork on Twitter, at the Turtle Dork on Instagram, and at Brian. I'm sorry, at the Turtle Dork one on Instagram, <laughs> and at Brian William Young on Facebook. Uh, wife Dork, what are you looking forward to this week? This is awkward. Like I don't. I'm in the middle of so many things. Like I like I've just finished uh, uh, Crazy Delicious. I've finished yeah. Sugar Rush. Yeah. Uh, I've finished I'll Be Gone in the Dark. We were planning yeah. on doing a uh, rewatch of Stephen King movies yes. in chronological oh, release of adaptation. Yeah, so I'm, I'm looking oh, forward shit. to that. I think that's going to be really exciting. Yeah. Yeah, that's okay. going to be fun. Uh, We've also been talking about can... trying to rewatch X Files. Um, this is an oh, area shit. in which we have and fa- tried and failed. How many seasons is Nine. X Files? It's a lot. God damn. It's a lot, yeah, and a lot. Um, the ratio a of, of good to okay is kind of Whoops. exhausting. Um, <laughs> but I'll, I'll, I'll go again. Where are we going? Yeah, you make an excellent point. Nowhere. <laughs> All right, you can follow her at Sidewalk Siren on Twitter and Instagram. She's also at Big Dork on Twitter and Instagram. She's also at Sidewalk Siren on Letterboxd. Uh, Brad, what are you looking forward to this week? Um, lots of things. Gonna discover some stuff. Gonna yeah. try to watch like a really great movie. You know, something I haven't yeah. seen before. Maybe like a classic huh. of some kind. Some yeah. much lauded movie. Uh, I okay. feel like I need a a good discovery right now. Yeah. 
um, Brian should start watching some Hitchcock movies. Wow. Yeah, and they got to get mean, back in it because I actually had – what was the one I was going to watch? Saboteur, I think I had in there. I got to get back because I could have been finished that uh, box set by now. But Years ago. Well, oh, I mean, sorry. I started – I actually got hey, through a pretty – you know, Bri- pretty Brian good. was doing good. Brian yeah, was doing good, and yeah. I want I want to talk some Hitchcock because I was watching okay. clips from some Hitchcock movies earlier today, and I was like, "Yo, I've got a Hitchcock f- hankering." Yeah. Okay. I'll, you got I'll, an itch I'll, for the hitch. I got an back. itch for the hitch. Itch for the hitch. Yeah, I'll get back into it. I think. Um, yeah, I got a couple of more in that box set. I'll try to finish those up. All right. Uh, you can follow that guy at. Mouth Dork on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, Letterbox, and Untapped. Uh, I'm looking for a Project Power. Uh, I'm looking forward to Project Power. That's that's really all I. <laughs> I'm so excited. I forgot. I didn't know. I, I didn't know that was this weekend. I'm so excited now. Holy shit! It's gonna make this week go by so slow. <laughs> all right. Uh, you can follow me at the Disco Dork on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook and Letterbox and all that other good stuff. Uh, that's gonna do it for us. Thank you all for listening. Thank you, Dorks, for humoring me uh, this week this on was our so review cast. Fun. Yeah. I love diving into this box set, and I Thank always you. love talking Bruce Lee with you. Like Same. it just. It gets me so jazzed. Yeah. Same. yeah. Happy Same. birthday, so man. Thank you. Yeah. I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, that's going to do it for us, ladies and gentlemen. Enjoy the rest of your week. Thank you all for listening. Be safe. Uh, be kind to one another. Wash your hands. Thank you all for listening. And until next time.